Selamat pagi. Selamat pagi. And good morning, and it is great to be here. My name is Paul Burke from the Australian National University, and thank you so much for coming this morning to talk about this very important topic of energy, energy in Indonesia. Um, I'd like to start by saying thank you very much to Pat Harris for coming, and also for, for all the um, dignitaries here as well. Um, it's great to have you in the audience and looking forward to your input for the discussion. This is research about a very exciting sector these days, energy, especially renewables, and here we're focused on the most exciting ones these days, solar and wind. The world is going through a boom in installations of solar and wind. But Indonesia is not yet fully joining in this boom sector. So in my presentation, I would like to start by saying I do not have any criticisms. I don't have any criticisms or anything like this. The idea is to look at the opportunity and to look at some ways to try to get the most from this opportunity of solar and wind. Okay. Uh, and every country is, is going through a process of doing some reforms to be more attractive for solar and wind. And I'll explain why this is such an exciting thing to be doing. In this paper, we are actually getting some insights from another key country, India. I will explain why India shortly. Um, but we, I took a trip to India, I was in Delhi for two weeks and we had many interviews. We learned a lot from the India case and we think it's a very good example to draw from. This is research with some other colleagues from the Australian National University. Uh, several colleagues, you can see, see the colleagues here. Uh, we've been working on the project together and our method has been many interviews and uh, reading literature and studying regulations as well. The solar and wind revolution that is happening at the moment. In 2017, in terms of new capacity additions. And here I am talking about net capacity. It means new capacity minus retirement of old capacity. Right? In 2017, in the world, more solar capacity was added than coal plus nuclear plus natural gas together. So solar is really becoming the key part of the energy investment story. Of course, more electricity is generated from coal, but in terms of new investments in capacity around the world, solar and then wind are becoming very big. More than 50% of net capacity installations are solar and wind around the world. And some countries, are really, their investment is being dominated by solar and wind, including Australia. You know, previously, solar and wind are too expensive. They were too expensive. They, they were premium price compared to other technologies like gas and coal. It's a fact. But these days, this story is cha has changed already and is continuing to change. Solar and wind are becoming cheaper and cheaper and are starting to really outcompete some fossil fuel technologies. The goal of this is what? The goal is clean, affordable, and also reliable energy for all. This is the SDG number seven. Yeah? So we have to think about all of these things. Clean is not enough. We also need it to be reliable. We need electricity when we, when we want it. Uh, and it also needs to be affordable as well. It's very important. How about Indonesia? Actually, Indonesia has a very ambitious targets for solar and wind and renewables. Very ambitious. The key target is this one, renewables and new energy, making up 23% of the primary energy mix by 2025. It's very ambitious and, you know, 2025 is very soon. It's not so far away. Um, so this is a very ambitious one, definitely. Also, when we 
look into the National Energy Plan of Indonesia. There's also ambition in there for solar and wind. 8.3 gigawatts of solar plus wind by 2025. Three, more than three quarters of this is solar, mostly solar in the plan, but also some wind. This is very ambitious because currently solar plus wind is less than 0.1 gigawatts. So in terms of growth rate, this is amazing. In other words, Indonesia itself has very ambitious targets for solar and wind, and our paper is trying to look at ways to help meet the target. Motivations for making the switch. Number one, clean energy. Oh, sorry, I should say cheap energy. Number one on the list here. Solar and wind, in terms of generation costs around the world, are now cheaper than coal, and cheaper than natural gas and nuclear. So, we want to be getting energy from the cheaper sources. This is the number one goal. Number two is clean air, local air. I found this statistic from some global study, Global Burden of Diseases study, that more than 78,000 deaths in Indonesia are from outdoor air pollution. Not all of these are from energy, because particulates pollution comes from the dust and things like this. But energy is making a contribution to morbidity and mortality in, uh, in many countries, including Indonesia. Local air pollution. Third one is fight climate change. This is a very serious issue. If we do not move to quickly reduce global greenhouse gas emissions, the world will be heading for two or three or four degrees warming by the year 2100. So 2100, that means children born today, they will be living to this year, 2100. This is ultra serious. Already we have had one degree of warming. But if we move to two or three degrees of warming, there will be many implications for the globe, including countries like Indonesia and including cities like Jakarta, which is a very low-lying city. Indonesia is quite vulnerable and exposed to climate change through storms and sea level rise and temperature increase as well. Hotter temperature leads to um, increased deaths from humans as well. So this is a very serious topic and many countries are trying hard to try to reduce emissions to address climate change. How about the costs of solar and wind? These graphs are for the United States because the US has some very good data. So for Indonesia, the cost would be higher. But let's understand about the cost for USA. This graph is showing LCOE, levelized cost of energy. That means it is including the capital cost and also the operating cost for energy. So it includes fuel cost for coal. LCOE for coal includes fuel cost. On the left hand side we have wind. And on the right hand side we have solar. And this is going from 2009 until 2018. We can see that the levelized costs of new projects are falling very quickly, especially for solar. The costs have fallen a lot. Later, I will show you for India, this is true as well, the costs have fallen a lot. Why are the costs falling? The technology is getting better, more efficient, the solar cell technology. The production is getting larger scale, and so there are economies of scale which are driving down the costs. And actually, we can thank some countries for this. Germany with lots of initial investment, and Japan as well in research. And these days, especially China, for mass production of solar cells and for helping to bring down that cost. China is now the largest producer of solar cells in the world. This is a very good story for energy, for us energy consumers because there are many opportunities now to switch towards wind and solar. Also, the cost reduction means that it is now cheaper to build a new solar or wind plant than it is to build a new coal by power station in many places, including the United States. Solar and wind are now starting to undercut the competitiveness of 
existing coal-fired power stations as well. What that means is in some locations it is cheaper to build a new solar power station than to operate the existing coal-fired power station. Remember, operating coal-fired power station, there are costs as well, fuel, maintenance, and so on. So solar is becoming quite competitive, including against existing stock. How about the potential in terms of the physical potential? And let's, of course, focus on Indonesia's case. This map is showing PV potential for the whole world. And the red color is the best places for PV. And the blue color is the worst places. For example, the United Kingdom is not so good for PV. Whereas the red color, for example, the desert area in Australia and in Africa is very, very good for PV. How about Indonesia's case? Indonesia is often the yellow, cap, yellow color. What it means is Indonesia is pretty good for PV. We could say it's still great for PV, but not as good as some locations, it's true. So, of course, if in Texas or California, it is even better for PV than it is in Java. Of course. But still, Indonesia has a lot of physical potential to substitute towards photovoltaics. Um, and a lot more than some other areas, especially in Northern Europe. For wind, Indonesia's potential is lower. Indonesia has wind and does have the ability to generate wind onshore and offshore. And of course, Indonesia has recently opened some wind capacity in South Sulawesi, starting with the Sidrap Wind Farm number one in South Sulawesi, which opened last year. Indonesia's wind is actually quite a bit is in Java Bali area, but also spread out across the country. So there is wind potential, but actually Indonesia's potential is much more on the solar side than on the wind. Okay, so we need to keep it in mind. Whereas some, some countries, for example, in Northern Europe, they're not so good for solar, but they're very good for wind. Near the North Pole, it's very windy. Scotland and Denmark, for example. Why India versus Indonesia? There are quite a few similarities, India and Indonesia. Actually, one interesting thing is the two countries are quite close to each other. When I studied the map, these islands here are India. This is Andaman and Nicobar Islands, including there's some island in here as well, Andaman, Andaman and Nicobar. It's not so far from Aceh. So I found this, this is one thing I learned from this study. Pretty close, Andaman and Nicobar and Aceh. Why else India and Indonesia? Uh, both countries currently rely a lot on coal. Both countries have had a lot of success in increasing electrification and improving the quality of the electricity grid. Per capita electricity consumption of both countries is almost exactly the same. There are quite a lot of similarities, but there are differences as well. One difference is Indonesia, Indonesia's electricity grid is less interconnected because of the island nature of the country. There is less interconnections. Although now with cable technology, it is becoming more and more possible to have the interconnections. India's grid is still being developed, but has much better national interconnectivity than Indonesia. This is very good for solar and wind because if it is not sunny here, maybe it is sunny here. And the electrons can be transported to the area that is not so sunny today. In, in terms of some comparisons, India versus Indonesia, both highly dependent on coal. And I mentioned this one about the interconnections. You know, in terms of the electricity system, India is more complicated than Indonesia in some ways. Indonesia has basically PLN. India has many utilities for electricity, each state. 
Electricity and energy is a concurrent power under the Indian Constitution. It means the states have the power, the control, and the federal also has responsibilities as well, the central government. So India's system is more complicated because there are many utilities playing in the system. India, of course, is a bigger country as well and has many complications. One other interesting thing about India is that there is some quite suitable land for solar. They have the desert area, Rajasthan and so on. And so this is quite suitable for solar and feeding into the grid. Indonesia has, especially Java, has fewer land spaces suited for solar. Uh, but still, India, Indonesia has a lot of opportunities for solar. One other interesting difference is for energy, India has very strong research capacity. They have some strong think tanks. For example, Terry, the Energy and Resources Institute, is very good. Lots of good electrical engineers and economists and others doing research on energy. It is fair to say that India has stronger research capacity currently in energy than for Indonesia. Um, and it's potential for Indonesia to invest additionally in research capacity. Both countries have a challenge with land access. Land access, often land is in a small parcel. Sometimes there is competing plans on the land. Access can be challenging. India has taken one step to try to reduce land access problems for solar and wind investors. India has done this by setting up the solar park investment area and, uh, and reduce this problem for the investors themselves. I will talk more about this shortly. Just to start off with on electricity access. You know, both, both countries have made great progress in some areas. For example, this graph is showing population access to electricity in the home as a percentage of the population. Starting in 2000, up until 2016, this is using International Energy Agency data. Both countries have had a big increase. For example, Indonesia has increased from 50 something percent in 2000 up to more than 90% in 2016. It's fantastic, it's a big achievement. And um, yeah, I think Indonesia should feel very proud about this effort, it's a big effort. Very quick. India also actually has less coverage in terms of residential access than Indonesia. Indonesia is doing better. Uh, but we can see India also has increased really quickly this century. So this graph is a very, very key graph. This graph is showing the solar and wind contribution to the electricity mix of India and of Indonesia. And the graph starts in 1985 and goes until 2017. Let's start with India. India has, as of 2017, reached about 5% of electricity from solar plus wind. Mostly wind in India's case so far. That's a pretty quick increase in the last few years. It, is, it takes time to change the electricity system. That's quite a quick increase. And 2018 will be in still higher. We should note that 5% is still a bit small. It's still not the majority, definitely not. It's still small, but it's increasing quite quickly. Let us check Indonesia's case. This is Indonesia's case. This actually, it is not zero, but when we ground it, it is zero. It's just increased a bit. So this is a very small one. The industry is in the early stage. Why this difference? Of 
course, Indonesia has focused on geothermal as well. Geothermal is not included in this graph. Geothermal for Indonesia is about 4% of electricity in 2017. Total renewables, India is winning 15%. Indonesia is 12%. So it's a bit closer than this one. But we can see India has focused quite a bit on wind and solar. And please note, these are the technologies that these days are becoming very cheap and competitive. Indonesia is still in the early stage. Where does Indonesia get electricity from? Most is from coal, like in Australia. Australia previously we were 80% coal. Now we are 60 because coal is diminishing in contribution and wind, solar and natural gas are increasing in Australia's case. In Indonesia, coal has been increasing in the share. Uh, there is natural gas and oil and then hydro, geothermal. We can see solar and wind is very small. In 2017, Indonesia's solar plus wind capacity was less than 0.1 gigawatts. India had 51 gigawatts. It's pretty big. India's targets are very big and ambitious. They have the target of 160 gigawatts by 2022. And they have even more ambitious targets after that. This is amazing, 160 gigawatts. And they are trying, they're building very big projects to try to reach this target. Please note, 160 gigawatts is much bigger than the whole Indonesian electricity system. It's more than double the size of the whole Indonesian electricity capacity. For India, how about the history of the sector? India has been trying quite hard for solar and wind for quite a while. They did not just start recently. In 1992, they started a whole ministry for, they called it non-conventional energy sources. The name of this ministry changed to Ministry of New and Renewable Energy. Whole ministry in 2006. They also had the Indian Renewable Energy Development Agency from the 1980s. And quite a long history of institutional effort behind renewables. A key step was this step, 2010. India launched the solar mission. This is what they call it, solar mission. Solar mission is a big program or agenda to promote solar. As part of the solar mission in 2011, they started this one, Solar Energy Corporation of India, SEKI. This corporation does many activities, including running the large-scale procurement process for solar power, large-scale reverse auction. SEKI is also involved in setting up solar parks, which I will talk about shortly. SEKI is playing a key role in the development of solar. India also has some institutes for research. For example, National Institute of Solar Energy, Wind Energy as well. These institutes, they provide data on the solar conditions. They provide information for investors and research. What are some keys to India's success story? There are three key steps to their story. Number one is strong facilitation by governments. Governments in Indian India, including the central government, have put a lot of effort behind solar and wind. What that means is the Prime Minister has given a very strong focus on it. They set up the solar mission with a very strong and ambitious target. They set up SEKI with the power to do some very important things like set up solar parks. 
So number one key step is government has led from the front and government leadership. This is key one. Number two is using the market, using the private sector. India has had large-scale procurement processes using reverse auctions. What is a reverse auction? It is like a tender, a bidding process. In the reverse auction for a solar park, it works like this. There is a solar park there. They have the auction. They say, okay, bidders, private companies, what is the lowest price that you will accept for a PPA, power purchasing agreement, to supply electricity into the grid? What is the lowest price you will accept? Three cents per kilowatt hour, four cents per kilowatt hour, what, what is it? And then they have the auction process. And the cheapest bids win the auction. What happens if you win the auction? You get the power purchasing agreement to sign and then you can supply electricity into the grid. So the key aspect for getting the very low price in India has been use the market through reverse auctions. Number three is not just reverse auction. We need to take the risk out of the investment. We need to try to de-risk the auction as much as possible. Why? Because if it is risky, the prices will be higher. And India doesn't want the high prices, they want the cheap ones. Right? How to take the risk out, some of the risk anyway. Number one is they set up the solar park. How did they do this? They bought and acquired land in a parcel, like this park. They provided it and then they leased out the land to the solar projects. How does this help to reduce the cost? It helps because the investors do not have to search for the land, do not have to buy the suitable land or lease the suitable land. They just go to the solar park and can find the land there for them. It helps. And they have to lease the land from the government. Number two is try to have the good transmission connections to the solar park. This helps to reduce the risk for the solar investor. They know that the transmission connection will be available for them and there. If they do not know this, then it's very risky to invest because what happens if they cannot sell the electricity? Number three is they have also used a payment security mechanism to try to reduce the risk even more. What does this mean? You know, in India there is a chance that some utilities will not pay or will not accept the electricity under the PPA. This mechanism is a fund which is trying to reduce this risk. If the state utility does not take it, then the investor can get some money from the fund to compensate it. Okay. What this means is it reduces the risk of offtake, offtake risk for the electricity investors. So three key steps for India's case, and I'll show you the price story for India. The three key steps, one is the government gave a big priority for clean energy especially solar and wind. Two, they went for market mechanism through auction and in, they tried to make it as attractive as possible for the private sector. They want the private sector to come and give. They would like international companies and other companies to come and play in the game to bid and build the project. And part of making it attractive is by reducing the risk through these mechanisms. For economists, with, this is actually very interesting. This is in line with, I'm not sure if you have heard of this book, The Entrepreneurial State by Mazzucato. She argues that economies work well when the state and the market, they are working together. State has the vision and the target. 
and sets and facilitates the market mechanism. And then the market does the job that it can do, providing the low cost and professional service here of solar supply. This graph is going to show the prices achieved for solar in India. The unit is Indian rupees per kilowatt hour. But don't worry, I will compare to Indonesian rupiah as well. You will see. And this one is showing the lowest solar price achieved in reverse auctions in India from 2010 to 2017. Let's check it. The price has reduced a lot over this time period. Previously, it was more than 10 rupees per kilowatt hour. In 2017, the lowest price was 2.44 rupees per kilowatt hour. It's reduced a lot. How did it reduce so much? Panels are getting cheaper. The industry is maturing. The risk is reducing somewhat due to mechanisms such as solar parks. India is not perfect and the risk is, some risk is still there, but they have achieved big success in terms of this sector. Price is getting cheap. How about for wind? So th this price is 3.7 US cents per kilowatt hour. That's the PPA feed-in price, supply price. It's good. How about for wind? Wind, in 2017, they started reverse auctioning for wind PPAs also. The cheapest wind PPA was for 2.43 rupees per kilowatt hour. It's basically identical to the solar price. It is much cheaper than the projects that they previously were paying for for wind. Previously, they were using a feed-in tariff system. Feed-in tariff system does not have the competition that an auction has. When they went to auction, they got a very cheap price for wind. About 3.7 US cents per kilowatt hour. It's good. Let's now compare with Indonesia. On this graph, I will show Indonesia BPP, national BPP for 2017. BPP is average cost of generation, BPP. It's this one. 2017 Indonesia BPP was 7.66 cents per kilowatt hour. In other words, solar and wind in India, the new projects, not the old projects, the new projects are now cheaper than the average generation cost in the Indonesian system. This is the average annual flow generation cost, or the cost um, of generating in 2017 and a lot cheaper, it's about half. So the potential is there, using the mechanisms from India and other countries. The potential is there in Indonesia to get quite a low price as well. If Indonesia has the option today, they would not, Indonesia would not get a cheap price like this. Why? Because it, currently investing in Indonesia is not as attractive as India. Risks are higher and costs are higher. But if there were some reforms and in the future it would be possible to get the cost down, something like this. For India, the cost might be falling as well. How about some policy issues for Indonesia's case? And then let's go to learning from India. Some issues for Indonesia's case. One issue that we think is quite important is this one for solar and wind projects. BOOT, boot, build, own. Boot is build, own, operate, transfer. What the T means, transfer means, is at the end of the PPA, maybe at the end of 25 years, the project should be handed to PLM. Right? This is the boot requirement in Indonesia. Boot requirement, sometimes it is okay. I think sometimes it's okay. For example, for solar park, if the project is leasing the area in the solar park project for 25 years, it's okay. But how about for 
solar installations on the land that the company already owns or on the big rooftop of the warehouse or industrial site. I mean big rooftop, not small one. How will boot work for those installations? We would not want, for example, let's imagine in Indonesia we have the palm oil plantation and we have some spare land. We are thinking about solar installation. But we do not want, at the end of our project, we do not want PLN to be participating in the project or to have the ownership of the panels on our land or maybe even <coughs> access to our land. We do not want it. So we will not do the project. In other words, for projects that are very embedded with existing assets like land and rooftop space, boot is a very big constraint to investment. And this is not just Indonesia but other countries as well. For projects very embedded with our current assets. If we have a big warehouse, we do not want PLN to own the warehouse solar panels after the end of our PPA. We do not want it. We do not want PLN owning our stuff or coming near our investment. So maybe we forget about solar. So the universal boot requirement in Indonesia actually seems to be quite a big constraint. Another one in Indonesia is domestic market obligations for coal. Of course in Indonesia coal is currently very powerful and dominant. In Indonesia, coal miners are currently required to reserve 25% of their coal for domestic generation of electricity. And there is a price cap for coal sales to electricity generators at $70 US per tonne of coal or below depending on grade. What it means is coal price is suppressed, is pushed down. So it makes it very hard for wind and solar to compete because it must compete against the low, artificially low price of coal. Indonesia also has subsidies for gasoline and diesel and on-grid electricity. It makes it harder for solar and wind to compete. As one example for this, if I am getting the cheap electricity at my home, I am less likely to install solar PV on, this, on the roof. Why? Because electricity from the grid is pretty cheap already. Indonesia has had some success recently in reducing the subsidy for electricity. Big success. Um, and we think that there's some potential to keep going with the reforms in this area. In Indonesia also there is some restrictions like protectionist restriction. For example, domestic content requirement for solar panels that a certain percentage of solar panels must be from the local content. <coughs> this tends to increase the cost of the project because the local panels tend to be more expensive than the imported panels and quality may be not there. If you want to have the cheap installations then requirements like this, they tend to push up the cost. And what does this do? It means the installation industry is smaller than otherwise. And it means that consumers are hurt as well from the additional cost. Indonesia also has a price cap on renewables. There is a regulation that is limiting the price of new renewables projects for solar and wind. For example, in regions where the regional BPP is greater than national BPP, cost of generation, then there's a price cap for solar projects and wind projects, 85% of the regional BPP. Remember, BPP is actually artificially low because coal-fired generators are getting cheap coal at the artificially low price below the world price. So therefore BPP is too low compared to the true cost. And the new solar and wind projects must outcompete this BPP in these areas. It's quite a challenging task for solar and wind. It's a constraint, especially for the early stage of development of the sector. In the future, when solar and wind have the low price, then maybe this is okay, but we are still in the early stage in Indonesia. 
In Indonesia, one issue also is regulatory uncertainty. The regulations change pretty frequently. And this adds costs for the investors because investors sometimes have to redesign the project to meet the new regulation. And some investors say Indonesia is uncertain, it's difficult to invest because it changes a lot. There also are some other issues, for example, delay in procurement processes in Indonesia. For example, recently there was a procurement pro process for Sumatra. It was a pre-qualification process and then the results were delayed for this process. This makes Indonesia somewhat less attractive for investors. Just one other small issue, and this is an issue in India as well, for rooftop solar. Currently we are just in the early phase, but currently in some areas it's difficult to get the net meter from PLN for rooftop solar installation. I think this will improve a lot, but currently it's an issue for the rooftop solar sector. Okay, so how about some positive ideas? Let's stick to positive ones and let's think about whether they can be useful for Indonesia's case. And I look forward to hearing your opinion on these ideas. Number one is how about the number one lesson from India is how about going for solar park and reverse option. Why solar park? It can help to reduce the costs a lot because then the investors don't have to worry about getting the land, can just focus on getting the cheap panels, doing a good job of installing and having a low price. This could attract a lot of interest for the sector in Indonesia. And that is what is needed, some excitement and attractive process. It should be a very exciting one. It, to have this process of large-scale reverse auction and solar power and to get the low price, then it's important to try to de-risk the auction. So try to have it so that it is simple and attractive. Maybe there is a secure PPA agreement and there is a secure offtake promise, type of promise that the, the, panels, the panels will be able to generate and sell throughout the term of the PPA. Offtake risk should be as low as possible. One big question is where to locate the solar park. Let's leave as a question. Yeah, you are the experts for Indonesia's case. I know Indonesia has some degraded agricultural land or the former coal mining land, but where to locate it, that is a question I will ask for you. Here is another idea that some countries, including Indonesia, sorry, including India and including Australia, we use this idea. It's a simple idea, the Green Certificate Scheme. This is called RPO, Renewable Portfolio Obligation Scheme. What is this scheme? This scheme works like this. If I generate solar or wind, I also get the certificate, green certificate. And PLN, in Indonesia's case, PLN would be required each year to purchase a certain quantity of certificates or acquire those certificates. What this means is, if you have a quantity goal for renewables, how to achieve it? What is the mechanism? The main mechanism that is used outside Indonesia is called RPO scheme. So that the electricity company would have to have a certain quantity of certificates each year. And the quantity would equal the national target, right? So first of all, national target is set. And then the rule is introduced. PLN would have to meet the target. How to meet it? It needs to have the certificates for renewables generation. These are called green certificates. For example, if the target is 10% of electricity, PLN would need certificates equal to 10% from projects in Indonesia. All the projects would be generating the certificates. It's just a quantity-based 
certificate or permit scheme, similar to emissions trading scheme, but this is for renewables generation. One idea is the board of PLN, maybe this should be one of their KPIs, key performance indicators, is to meet the target for renewables. Currently they are not meeting the target for renewables and maybe Indonesia will not meet the target. How to meet it? This is the main scheme which is used overseas, uh, Renewable Portfolio Obligation Scheme. And you know, there could be some financial reward for PLN for meeting it, something like this. The idea is to try to change the incentives. Currently PLN may be slow for renewables. How to change it? One way to change it is to go for green certificate scheme and maybe some reward system for PLN as well. This is used in India. Some of their solar projects they include the incentive for the utility. If the utility meets the target, they get the incentive. This type of scheme is easier to implement in Indonesia than India, for one reason. Indonesia has PLN. India has many utilities. And the state utilities in India can kind of ignore the central, central government scheme kind of ignore it or get around it. Indonesia is easier. PLN is owned by the government of Indonesia. So it's more direct and simple. Could be an idea for Indonesia's case. This type of scheme is relevant for small scale and large scale. For example, with this type of scheme, if there are more small scale PV systems put in place, PLN would be very happy because it helps them to meet the target. So it changes the incentive for PLN. They become very happy when small scale and large scale solar and wind is installed. Another idea is energy subsidies. Indonesia has had some success for reducing electricity and oil subsidies. We can see it here. Previously on the budget it was more than 300 trillion rupiah for subsidies. In 2017 it is less than 100 trillion. It has increased a bit since then. Continuing the subsidy reform is a good way to help solar and wind. It makes it more competitive. Also it helps electric vehicles as well and fuel efficient vehicles. Much more likely to buy an electric vehicle if we do not have subsidized oil. Um, also, there are some other reform opportunities. For example, remove or reduce the domestic market obligation for coal. If coal prices increase, then this will improve the competitiveness of new solar and wind clean projects. Another idea from India is coal tax. And actually, all of these ideas are discussed in Jakarta as well. So Indonesians also, including the government, are discussing various ideas here. These are ideas. India has had a tax on coal for some years. Tax on coal helps wind and solar become more competitive. And it is justified because coal is very polluting and leads to air pollution and leads to sickness and climate change. A coal tax is quite good in some ways. It raises, raises some revenue which can be used for many good projects or for reducing other taxes in Indonesia. And please note, Ministry of Finance is looking for ways to increase tax collections. So something like coal tax, like in India, may be a smart way and help to meet the renewables targets. There are some other options as well, and Indonesia considered some of these options in this green paper from 2009 from Ministry of Finance. Considered carbon tax and some other fiscal ideas to try to improve the energy system towards more renewables. Here is another idea from learning from India's case. India has many agencies for renewables. So they have a strong institutional backing for renewables. How about for Indonesia? 
what about this idea, Indonesian Clean Energy Agency, or something like this, or maybe more than one agency? How about this idea? There are many responsibilities that this type of agency could do, could fulfill. For example, managing the reverse auction process for renewables, like SECI in India. For example, establishing solar parks, like SECI in India. For example, administering the RPO scheme. This type of agency could do something like this. And some other things as well, for example, accessing concessional finance for investment in solar and wind. There is some cheap finance from international agencies and an Indonesian agency might have more uh, success in accessing this finance. Some other things like investing in R&D also. Okay, just a few more ideas and then I will wrap up. One key idea for Indonesia's case is the best solar panels and wind turbines are from overseas, best quality and cheapest. So as far as possible, it's a good idea to try to benefit from the cheap imports. Currently in Indonesia, there are some constraints, for example, 5% tariff on solar, plus the local content requirements that I mentioned already. Where possible, if possible, it's a good idea to try to be attractive for imports of these products. Why? This is better for the Indonesian installation sector. And the installation sector employs many more people than the production sector for solar panels. Solar panels can be produced very cheaply and it's very high uh, investment sector. And China is producing cheaply and some other countries. Indonesia could benefit from the cheap imports and this would be good for consumers and local installers. One key issue for solar and wind is the intermittency issue. Solar and wind are intermittent resources. Solar PV does not produce during the night time. What to do about this? Currently in Indonesia, this is a small problem because solar and wind in Indonesia are very small. So it's not a big issue so far, actually. But in the future, it will become a bigger issue. There are some technologies like batteries which are becoming cheaper and cheaper every year. They're getting cheap. And India and Australia are investing more in batteries. One other idea for storage is pumped hydro. Pumped hydro works like this. It's not the on-river hydro. I'm talking about off-river pumped hydro. All you need is like this. You need one reservoir here, like dam area here and one reservoir up the hill. And then you need the vertical elevation. Maybe 100 meters is good or higher. And then during the daytime, you pump the water up. At nighttime, the water comes down, turns the turbine and generates electricity at night. This is called pump hydro and is currently a leading energy storage technology. Indonesia is a perfect place for pumped hydro because it has many hills and mountains. Also has some water. So it's a good place for pumped hydro storage. My colleagues at ANU have been doing mapping of pumped hydro locations in Indonesia, potential locations. And there are many potential locations for pumped hydro in Indonesia. So this could become part of the future energy system. Lots of solar, because Indonesia is solar rich. And for storage and maintaining the grid, one option is pumped hydro. Pump the water up during the daytime. During nighttime, water comes down and turns the turbine and generates hydroelectricity. The water can be like <coughs> up and down. It's a closed system, internal system, and then so on. Batteries and other systems also are useful. One exciting thing these days is private companies more and more want renewables. There is an international initiative, RE100. These companies have signed up for 100% renewable energy. But in Indonesia, how can they get it? 
One way to help them to get it is the green certificate scheme. If Indonesia had the green certificate scheme, these companies could buy the certificates. Then they would have green certificates equal to their electricity demand. That makes them 100% renewable energy. Or these companies could directly procure via business-to-business -business contracts. But the key thing is for Indonesia to make it an attractive investment environment for this to happen. Demand is there, but how about the supply side for renewables projects? Almost finished, but one thing I would like to mention for Indonesia's case is where can the solar panels go? Indonesia does not have big land areas in Java. Some, but not so much. But, you know, Jakarta and also has a lot of rooftop space. A lot. And so I think personally that the rooftop sector has a lot of potential for solar in Indonesia. And batteries are getting cheaper and it makes a lot of sense, I think. Also, the industry is starting to get going. This is a picture of Bank Indonesia. And the Indonesia government is requiring installations on government rooftops. So the industry is starting. And the question is, will it have the quick growth or will it just have the slow growth? There are some other issues in, in Indonesia which I'm happy to talk about, maybe during Q&A. The Constitutional Court has made some decisions which limit the involvement of foreign enterprises in Indonesia. It tends to increase the cost. And that has led to the domestic content requirements and boot. It tends to increase the cost. It's an issue. Um, some other issues, for example, the bottom one here, is transitioning away from coal. This is a long-run issue for Indonesia. How to make sure that the former workers in the coal-fired power stations and the coal mines, how can they have a good transition to the cleaner energy economy? All right, thank you very much for listening and for these ideas, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Today we have two discussions for, uh, uh, to discuss the paper. One is Papa uh, Anis Yahya, who is Director for New and Renewable Energy at the Ministry for Energy and Mineral Resources. So, um,
fosil ini juga uh, di satu sisi misalnya nih ya di minyak mungkin sudah uh, kurang tetapi ada lagi subsidi di LPG sepapal so, ya also personal subsidi oleh LPG 60% or 70% of our uh, LPG for the subsidy LPG, subsidized LPG <laughs> from wheat import. Ini saya mencoba untuk melihat dulu permasalahan-permasalahan yang diangkat. Kemudian terkait dengan DKTN. Memang kita juga mengalami dilema juga dengan TKT di satu sisi kita mengharapkan untuk memaksimalkan produk lokal karena itu bisa memberikan dampak ekonomi yang lebih uh, panjang kepada uh, tentunya kepada uh, Indonesia daripada kalau hanya langsung impor tetapi kita juga sudah tahu kelemahannya ada pada kualitas dan harganya cenderung lebih tinggi. Nah, Bapak Ibu yang kami hormati, uh, yang berikutnya tadi diangkat isu terkait dengan harga yang sudah dikat 85 persen untuk PLTS dan WIN. Uh, Mungkin nanti bisa kita coba lihat latar belakangnya. Kenapa sampai demikian? Dan seperti apa sekarang respon stakeholder terkait dengan Kemudian uh, ketidakpastian kebijakan yang berubah-ubah ini juga diangkat yang kita tahu bahwa tahun lalu 2017 atau tahun lalu 2017 ada perubahan regulasi yang sangat pendek ada dalam satu tahun ada tiga kali regulasi mengenai harga komite berubah mulai dari Tur Permen 12 kemudian menjadi Permen 43 lalu menjadi Permen 50 kemudian isu yang terkait dengan uh, procurement dan juga uh, satu pak masalah BOT adalah uh, masalah bagaimana kita menerjemahkan undang-undang dasar yang terkait dengan penguasaan negara Kementerian SDM merespon pendapat atau fatwa-fatwa terkait dengan penguasaan negara. Memang banyak banyak pandangan terkait dengan hal ini. Tentunya itu orang hukum lah yang paling memahami. Tetapi diterjemahkan bahwa penguasaan negara ya ETN memang seperti yang kita kita lihat sekarang itu harus ada di transfer dan menjadi milik negara memang di dalamnya ada banyak kontroversi seperti Pak Paul tadi sampai kalau tanahnya tanah sendiri di transfer 
sebagian lokasinya untuk titik-titik tertentu mau dipasangi wipa tanah punya PTP pembangkit PLT Bayu punya swasta etiket harus diserahkan nah memang di sini uh, diskusinya banyak tetapi kami perlu juga menyampaikan bahwa dari beberapa eh, dari banyak uh, proyek EBT khusus untuk yang besar-besar umumnya mereka tidak mempermasalahkan mengenai lahan meskipun harus sewa atau kerjasama yang memang banyak bermasalah karena kami lihat dari uh, apa namanya dari size project project-project yang small scale itu lebih banyak memang bermasalah dengan lahan. Kenapa? Pada saat proyek si pemilik proyek mau mendapatkan pinjaman support finance, mereka kesulitan karena listrik uh, proyeknya itu sudah dititikkan at the end of the project you have to transfer yours. Jadi benefitnya oleh lembaga finance menjadi kurang menarik dan sulit untuk mendapatkan pembiayaan itu itu masalahnya dia. Ya. Sementara untuk proyek-proyek besar enggak ada masalah dan pembiayaan karena mereka disupport langsung yang kuat dari luar. Bapak Ibu terkait dengan BOT kami melihat bahwa dari 70 proyek PPA yang ditandatangani pada tahun 2017 sampai dengan saat ini itu pada PPA proyek PPT yang saya maksud kapasitas totalnya sekitar 1400 lebih megawatt hingga Desember uh, hingga, hingga Januari ini empat proyek itu sudah sibuk dua tiga puluh dua puluh sembilan proyek sedang konstruksi sepuluh proyek sudah menyelesaikan kewajiban jaminan pelaksanaan kepada PLN dan tinggal uh, satu step lagi akan menuju ke konstruksi 27 proyek masih belum mendapatkan finance sampai sekarang Bu saya punya waktu berapa? Oke. kalau begitu saya harus coba artinya yang dipesan yang mau saya angkat bahwa dengan BOOT pun mereka sudah melihat sebagai satu peluang yang tidak harus menjadi penghambat yang utama sehingga mereka bisa jalan dengan BOT meskipun dengan mekanisme BOT dan yang 27 yang saya sebutkan masih berproses untuk uh, masuk sampai kepada implementasi domestik uh, mengenai TKDN kita pun juga harus memikirkan bagaimana nilai tambah lebih I think Pak Paul Wia also talking about the PWNT if we talk about the local content so we cannot also uh, rely 
sekarang sudah ada baru di, baru memang baru di ini karena memang permasalahannya ada adalah ketika mereka mau melakukan uji tes biayanya mahal nah sekarang sudah ada di nasional BPPT mungkin bisa dimanfaatkan regulasi yang memang kita coba perbaiki uh, isunya memang sangat kental itu tapi mohon maaf Permen 50 sekarang sudah ada revisinya lagi di 2018. Tetapi itu revisi mendasar tidak hanya menambahkan satu uh, apa namanya jenis pembangkit lagi yang terkait dengan bioenergi uh, BBM. 85 persen masih tetap karena itu pun juga masih berlaku jalan dan itu masih ada yang mau dilakukan. Tetapi Pak Paul, uh, thank you very much for your recommendation, all of your recommendation, because I think this is it. Your recommendation is very useful to, to make our regulation and also effort to develop more renewable energy to achieve our target is very useful. But yes, you, yeah, we also has another concern related to many, many others consideration. So we, 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 just, we do not only talk about the renewable energy, but we are also has another important issue to increase the access of electricity because now our electrification ratio is this low. Uh, we are still has more than 2,500 villages to not have electricity. So we are also need to concern on this. And then you are also mentioned about the, uh, there is a differences between Indonesia and India related to the connect, connect and the connection. So this is also one of the big barrier for us. How do we accelerate um, the, uh, the intermittent power plant with this condition? This is also one of our a very big issue. Because now our concern is we need to electrify in the very remote area, and then we cannot do like a, a reverse option, and not effective to develop a reverse option in, in the area. So, how to how to accelerate by uh, by considering this situation, especially for the eastern part of Indonesia? Uh, which we know that the uh, implementation of uh, electrification in this area is very low and then there is electricity supply but high cost electricity supply because we use diesel. Then uh, actually we are also has another, another approach one meter another approach to replace the use of diesel on a Maybe there is about a four gigawatt of electricity, uh, diesel electricity uh, in Indonesia. So we try to replace the diesel use to the CPO by adding some additional equipment to the existing engine. So this is our next uh, uh, program, and we are also uh, trying to blow. Uh, new energy to uh, actually to love the cool liquid, the cool um, gasification, and also cool uh, cool to liquid uh, program because we we try to um, yeah, to to overcome a barrier related to the the limitation of oil and also for us. Okay, thank you very much for your recommendation and serious support. Thank you. Our second discussion is with Asetias Ami Indianto. Dr. Indianto is Senior Advisor at the, for Energy and Regulatory Affairs for the USAID Indonesia Clean Energy Development Project. I'll then let us see Thank you. Pagi Bapak Ibu, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. So, thank you very much for the uh, presentation.
Shan, I hope you have a client aids. And um, I think we learned a lot from the information that you provided us. I would like to somehow look into the same uh, object, subject, but probably a different uh, angle. Um, first is the sequence of the process. Uh, second is on the planning aspect. And the third one is on the capacity building. On the sequence, um, I want to highlight that as um, the information that I have, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong. On the India case, um, it is uh, started with the institutional framework, strengthening the institutional framework. So there are new institutions set up and then also the regulatory um, improvement and specific parts of the institutions. But in the recommendation when you mentioned about the uh, reverse auction, the precondition is um, treated as if it's already there. Uh, but uh, as far as I know that in India even the de-risking process is come earlier before the uh, reverse auction. So the starting from the institutional and also the regulatory uh, uh, improvement, we see that you know they are of integrated vertical mandates from real from the uh, top down, but also uh, clear price and long term uh, contract for land. Uh, that's also the building permit already provided, infrastructure as you mentioned already provided, standard PPA terms, and basically everything else was provided and clear. So the investor only come and you know just give your name and sign. So that is the prerequisite, I think, the pre-existing condition for the reverse option. So if we uh, sometimes the uh, recommendation for reverse option uh, was understood as you know it comes first and then the rest of the uh, condition that comes after. I just want to highlight that there are the sequence that needs to be uh, carefully taken care of and all this these um, days of doing business, certainly the uh, clarity of the uh, topoxy uh, should come before the reverse option. Uh, secondly, you know, we, we also experienced that the Indonesia has tried some form of action before and they already mentioned that it's uh, not clear, the result is still uh, pending. It's, I think there are also some problems, issues that are realized after the, the process was uh, implemented. So that's why I emphasize the importance of understanding the requirements of the uh, reverse option or whatever mechanism that are uh, going to be uh, tried. Um, we experienced before from the hydro uh, uh, power plant development that you know, the excitement were there, people are uh, interested to, uh, to develop hydro projects, but there has been at that time lack of understanding about the technical as well as the financial requirements of the uh, project. Leading to, as we can imagine, there are uh, feasibility studies that are not really reflecting the real condition of the site. Uh, we even identified many of the feasibility study documents are basically like copy and paste from different areas, which is uh, really not working uh, to uh, support the development of the sector. So the interest of the developers, I think, uh, also requires some uh, capacity building uh, and also the information clarity beforehand. Uh, the previous frenzy in hydro market also uh, lead to uh, NPL, non-performance loan. Uh, I understand at one point of time uh, we have 
to assist the Bank of Indonesia to North Sumatra to um, find uh, some clarification why there are so many hydro projects there that are not uh, servicing their debt. And also there has been a lot of cost overruns over there and also a delay in um, construction and the commissioning time. So we found out basically the technical issues like the uh, uh, facility study that are not properly done, as well as the capacity where actually the developer do not have financial um, capacity to uh, implement the project. So um, that's one thing. So that I just would like to emphasize one of the sequence. Uh, secondly, the um, so how that uh, imply for ambition? So that is the attractiveness needs to be built. Um, but there are, uh, as I have mentioned, there are several things, and also I highlight that there are several issues that uh, equally difficult to address. So we come up first. So in that sense, uh, I see we can probably find some a champion or you know, because geographical spread in Indonesia provides an opportunity uh, as a breakthrough because there are uh, you know in terms of land availability, in terms of the institutions, uh, the panda that are willing and have uh, uh, what you call open minded to, to try uh, with the new uh, skills. So I would like to say that um, instead of looking probably like across the country, maybe we should find some uh, potential champions uh, and also both local and as well as national. The second aspect is also planning. Uh, we understand that there are several plans uh, related to energy, both in the national level as well as in the province. Uh, in the provincial level, there are planning related to GHG emission reduction in energy, and then also the NUET, the energy, uh, national energy, uh, provincial energy plans. And the most recent one is the uh, Sustainable Development Goals number seven, also related to energy. Uh, with all those plans, uh, we hope that the local government, the provincial government, has already also identified some uh, champion or priority projects, priority targets, so that they can be engaged as uh, part of the uh, solution. So, um, we would like to see the, the implementation from the paper to the actual um, project uh, to be developed uh, for implementation in the uh, profit setting as well. And then the third part is the capacity building. So in the, if we realize that the planning plays a very significant role to identify the actual challenge as well as the actual potential solutions, um, we would like to see the more of the um, stakeholders uh, have uh, proper understanding about the renewable energy uh, development 